Good day everyone. I am Teacher Joyce. I am Teacher Jade. I am Teacher Marielle. I am Teacher Diesel. Hi, I am Teacher April. A student of Cebu Technological University, Borrelli Campus, taking Bachelor of Secondary Education, major in General Science. Today, my group mates and I are going to discuss the performance-based test. First, let me introduce to you the learning outcomes for this topic. These are develop performance-based tests to assess selected learning competencies for the key to 12 curriculum guide. Second, construct appropriate scoring rubrics for giving students product or practices. So now, we already know the learning outcome from this topic. Before jumping into our topic, which is performance-based test, let's unlock first these words, which are performance-based and test. The word performance means it is defined as the action or process of carrying out or accomplishing an action, task, or function. In academic, performance is the measurement of students' achievement across various academic subjects. Teachers and education officials typically measure achievement using classroom performances, graduation rates, and results from a standardized test. The word based is used as a point from which something can be developed. And the word test used for measuring the skills, knowledge, intelligence, capacities, or aptitudes of an individual or group. All in all, performance-based tests measure students' ability to apply their skills and knowledge learned from a unit or units of study. Typically, this task challenges students to use their higher order thinking skills to create a product or complete a process, said by Sean 2010. Now, as we already know the meaning of performance-based test, um, let's know what is the reason why performance-based test is considered as one of the alternative assessment technique in assessing students' learning. There has been a widespread dissatisfaction with the outcomes of typical standardized objective examination in recent years. As a result, greater work has been put into finding alternative assessment techniques for evaluating educational outcomes and processes, as well as measures more complicated educational process. Multiple choice tests, for example, has been criticized since they are said to be incapable of assessing complex problem-solving skills and useless uh, capturing processes that occur in every classroom activities. Education have so concentrated their efforts on developing alternative assessment methods that would helpfully address the problems with existing assessment methods. Performance-based assessment is one of the alternative assessment techniques that has been proposed. Performance-based assessment technique think that the best way to determine a student's or pupil's ability in a particular task is to observe them in the field. This belief appears to be in line with constructivist educational philosophy, which is frequently discussed in philosophy of education. The performance-based test is designed to assess students in which students will be evaluated on what they know, what they do, and how they learn with exhibiting in. Example Performance-Based Assessment Test It's important to make learning exciting for students. Motivate students by incorporating fun classroom games into your lesson. Here are the top 10 classroom games that will provide fun ways to engage your students in academic learning. Number 1 Charades. Select a student to stand at the front of the room and act out a word from your list. No speaking aloud. The rest of the class must then guess what the student is attempting to portray. Other students can shout out their guesses or put their hands up depending on your teaching preference. Whoever guesses correctly can act out the next word. 
You might like to experiment with playing as a whole class where half competes against the other half or in smaller groups with time limits. Number 2. Puzzles. Separate your class into groups. Or simply use table groupings. Then hand out a puzzle for each group to piece together. You may use images, words, calculations, or concepts printed, or stuck on card or paper, and cut into random shapes like puzzle pieces. Number 3. Pictionary. Students work in small groups. One student from each group is chosen to start, and they must draw the subject-related concept you state, within a given time 30 seconds to 2 minutes. The rest of the group must then guess what she is drawing. The first group to correctly guess the word wins. The game repeats until every student has had a turn or there are no more words on your list. Number 4. Scattergories. Put up a simple table on the whiteboard, with a different category in each column. For example, rivers, fruits, animals, or cities. You may alter the categories for difficulty according to your class's level. Randomly select a letter of the alphabet. Now, within a time limit, groups or pairs of students must identify one example per category. The first group to correctly do so wins. Hi everyone, I'm April Mi Abilior. So, today I will be discussing about performance tasks and rubrics and exemplars. So, first, we will define performance tasks. In performance tasks, Students are required to draw on the knowledge and skills they possess and to reflect upon them for use in the particular task at hand. Not only are the students expected to obtain knowledge from a specific the student or subject matter, but they are in fact required to draw knowledge and skills from the other disciplines in order to fully realize the key needed in doing the task. So, Kanidi ang performance task kay dili na makalear ng usa ka estudyante kay dap, makal, maka dapat ma-apply sa tunay niya nga discipline nga nakuha niya sa pagbuhat niya sa task. Rubrics and exemplars. Modern assessment methods tend to use rubrics to describe student performance. So what is a rubric? A rubric is a scoring method that lists the criteria for a piece of work or what counts. For example, purpose, organization, details, voice, and mechanics are often what count in a piece of writing. It also articulates gradations of quality for each criterion from excellent to poor. Perkins et al. 1994 provide an example of rubric scoring for student inventions and least criteria and gradations of quality for verbal, written, or graphic reports on the student's invention. This figure shown here is a prototype of rubric scoring. As you can see, this rubric lists the criteria in the column on the left, which explain first the purpose of the invention, second, the feature or parts of the invention and how they help it serve its purposes, third, the pros and cons of the design, and fourth, how the design connects to the other things past, present, and future. On the other hand, the four columns to the right of the criteria describes varying degrees of quality, from excellent to poor. So you can see here, most acceptable, acceptable, less acceptable, and not acceptable. There are many reasons for the seeming popularity of rubric scoring in the Philippine school system. First, they are very useful tools for both teaching and evaluation of learning outcomes. So which means that rubrics have the potential to improve student performance as well as monitor it by clarifying teachers' expectations and by actually guiding the students how to satisfy these expectations. Secondly, rubric seems to allow students to acquire wisdom in judging and evaluating the quality of their own work in relation to the quality of the work of other students. So it means that through rubrics, Students became more aware of the problems associated with their solution to a problem and with the problems inherent in the solutions of other students. So in other words, rubrics increases the student's sense of responsibility and accountability.
Third, rubrics are quite efficient and tend to require less time for the teachers in evaluating student performance. So teachers tend to find that by the time a piece has been solved and peer assessed according to a rubric, they have little something to say about it. When they do have something to say, they can often simply circle an item in the rubric, rather than struggling to explain the flaw or the strength they have noticed and figuring out what to suggest in terms of improvements. So, in simple words, um, rubrics provide students with more informative feedback about their strengths and areas in need of improvement. Finally, it is easy to understand and construct a rubric scoring guide. So most of the items found in the rubric scoring guide are self-explanatory and require no further help from outside experts. So let's take for example, what if your student asked, why did you grade me that way? Or stated, you never told us that we'll be graded on grammar. So as a grading tool, rubrics can address these issues since it will increase objectivity and reduce subjectivity. So natay mga step diri on sa gusao na to pag create og rubric. So so the first one is survey models. Show students examples of good and not so good work. Identify the characteristics that make the good one good and the bad ones bad. So Anang meaning to say nga, ipakita na to ang kanang, pakita jud ang kanang what makes kanang sa o sa kabotang good and bad. So, so, the second one is define criteria. From the discussions on the models, identify the qualities that define good work. So, kanang ipakita na to ang, so, ipakita jud na to ang kanang criteria, ang kanang qualities sa o sa ka windot na work. Then, next, agree on the levels of quality. Describe the best and worst levels of the quality, then fill in the middle levels based on your knowledge of common problems and discussion of not so good work. So next, practice on models. Using the agreed criteria and levels of quality, evaluate the models presented in step 1 together with the student. So the fifth one, use self and peer assessment. Give students their tasks. As they work, step them occasionally for self and peer assessment. So the sixth one, revise. Always give students time to get revised their work based on the feedback they get in step five. So, so sa katong buhat no dili magina to na isya ipas judayon. So magrevise pag yuta kaniya to check na patay sa yon para nindut sa katong work na ipas. So then the seven one, use teacher assessment. Use the same rubric student used to access. There you work yourself so writing and selecting effective rubrics there are two main aspects of rubrics these are the criteria and the descriptions of the level of performance criteria is the assignment expectations and the qualities that the final work should display while the descriptions of the level of performance is to instantiate those expectations at different levels of competence as we can see in figure one it is an example of desired characteristics of criteria for classroom rubrics. In the table, it is written there in, for, in the first column, the criteria, which are the appropriate, definable, observable, distinct from one another, complete, and able to support descriptions along a continuum of quality. Each criteria has its own explanation. So, for example, here in the first one, which is appropriate, the explanation that is written there is each criteria represents an aspect of a standard curricular goal or instructional goal or objective that students are intended to learn. Shown here in figure two is the desired characteristics of descriptions of levels of performance for classroom rubrics. So the characteristics of the descriptions of levels of performance are descriptive, clear, cover the whole range of performance, distinguish among levels, set, center the target performance, it may be acceptable, mastery, and passing at the appropriate level. And lastly, feature parallel descriptions from level to level. In column two, we can see explanation. Like for example, descriptive, for descriptive, 
performance is described in terms of what is observed in the work. Tips in designing rubrics. Terms like creative, innovative, and other vague terms needs to be avoided. A rubric is made to teach as well as evaluate. Instead of these words, try words that convey ideas which can readily be observed. Patricia Crosby and Pamela Hens, both a 7th grade teacher, solved the same problem in a rubric for oral presentations by actually listing ways in which students could meet the criteria. This approach provides valuable information to students on how to begin a talk and avoid the need to define elusive terms like creative. So specifying the levels of quality can often be very challenging also. Spending a lot of time with the criteria helps but in the end what comes out are often subjective. There is a clever technique often used to define the levels of quality. It essentially graduates the quality levels through the responses like yes, yes but, no but, and no. So rubrics are scales that differentiate levels of students' performances. They contain the criteria that must be met by the student and the judgment process that will be used to rate how well the student has performed. An exemplar is an example that delineates the desired characteristics of quality in ways students can understand. These are important parts of the assessment process. So well-designed rubrics include performance dimensions that are critical to successful task completion, criteria that reflect all the important outcomes of the performance task, a rating scale that provides a usable, easily inter interpreted score, and lastly, criteria that can reflect concrete references in clear language understa understandable to students, parents, and other teachers. In summary, we can say that to design problem-based tests, we have to ensure that both processes and end results should be tested. The tests should be designed carefully enough to ensure that proper scoring rubrics can be designed so that the concerns about subjectivity in performance-based tests are addressed. Indeed, this needs to be done anyway in order to aut automate the test so that a performance-based testing is used widely. Automating performance-based test. Automating procedure is not an easy task. The sets of tasks that comprise a performance-based test have to be chosen carefully in order to tackle the design issues that was mentioned. Moreover, automating the procedure imposes another strict requirement for the design of the test. We have seen that in order to automate a performance-based test, we need to um, identify a set of tasks which all lead to the solution of a fairly complex problem. For the testing software to be able to determine whether a student has completed any particular task, the end of the test should be accompanied by definite change in the system. The testing software can track this change in the system to determine whether the student has completed the task. Indeed, a similar condition applies to every aspect of the problem-solving activity that we wish to test. In this case, a set of changes in the system can indicate that the student has the desired competency. So in summary, the following should be kept in mind as we design a performance-based test. The first one is that each performance test or problem that is used in this test should be clearly defined in terms of performance standards not only for the end result but also for the strategies used in various stages of process. Second. A user need not always end up accomplishing this task. Hence, it is important to identify important milestones that a test taker reaches while solving the problem. Third, having defined the possible strategies, the process and milestones, the selection of tasks that comprise a test should allow uh, the design of good rubrics for scoring. And the last one is every aspect of the problem-solving activity that we wish to test had to lead a set of changes in the system so that the testing software can collect evidence of the student's competency.